Welcome to Seaford Baptist Church for this pre-recorded Sunday morning service for the 19th of February. I'm Roger Case and we'll be bringing the message later in the service. Now let's commit this time to our Heavenly Father by opening ourselves to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit as we worship and as we breathe the air of heaven, as we pray and as we listen to the scriptures opened up. This morning, in our series on John's Gospel, we'll be looking at John chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. So if you're joining us online, you might want to have your Bible ready. So let's pray. Almighty God, we want so much to honour you in all that we do this morning. We are here because you have called us, and we know it's your desire that we be transformed by our encounter with you through the Holy Spirit working in us. Lord, do whatever you need to do with us this morning and better prepare us for the work in your world to which you have called us as individuals and as a people. Amen. Praise to the Lord, O let all that is in us adore him. All that has life and breath, come now with praises before him. As we worship God this morning, we're going to sing together, God is worthy, God is worthy. Now we'll sing this all together, you'll recognise the tune from Frère Jacques, and then we're going to sing it as a round. So we have Christy, Palaja and Alanis to sing after me, so you can choose who you follow. But it doesn't matter if you get lost, the main thing is that we're being creative as we worship our Creator God.
worship Him forever. Worship Him forever. Worship Him forever. God is great. God is great. God is gracious. God is gracious. God is gracious. God is gracious. Never will He leave us. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Revelations five. The scroll and the lamb. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the skull from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped.
Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seals of the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave Is he worthy? Again, I'm sure you remember Andy talking to us last week about that intimate dinner Jesus had with Lazarus, Martha and Mary, and how Mary anointed his feet with spikenard and dried them with her hair. Straight after, there was the very public acclamation during what we call his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, as the coming king in fulfilment of prophecy. And now, at the crest of that public acclamation, comes the incident we're looking at today. And I will read it to you. John 12, verses 20 to 36. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, 
we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while, a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Now, the question we ask first is, why did the request of some Greek people to see Jesus seem to trigger this response? And were they anyway? If they were celebrating the Jewish festival, they were unlikely to be non-Jews, and more likely Hellenistic Jews, such as we find later in Acts 6.1, and we'll come to that a little later. There were two main groups of Jewish people at this time. There were the Hellenists, or as Greek, it's Helleniston, Greeks or Greek-speaking or Greek-cultured Jews, and the Hebrews, Hebraicus, Aramaic-speaking, and traditionally cultured Jews who resisted Hellenization with its Greek culture. It was often at odds with traditional understanding of the Mosaic law. And at this point, stay awake, because I'm going to give you a little history of Israel from the time of Alexander the Great in the latter part of the 4th century BC, and particularly the Seleucids and Antiochus III Epiphanes to help explain what was going on in Judaism at this time. I'm sure you'll bear with me just for a short while. When Alexander the Great swept through the Levant, that's present-day Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and then Egypt, he went on to conquer Persia, the world's largest empire up to that time, and only stopped conquering when he reached India because his army had had enough. He turned back but only to die in Babylon, upon which the leading Greek generals fought over the spoils of empire. Seleucus got most, but Ptolemy got Egypt and most of the Levant, including Israel. Under Ptolemy, the Jews had a fair amount of freedom to practice their religion until the Seleucids decided to expand their territory and wrested the Levant from the Ptolemies. Got all that? Good. Now, this was accompanied by a forceful and even brutal campaign to crush the Jewish religion and its culture and replace it with a Greek or Hellenistic one. This culminated in a savage repression under Antiochus III, who called himself Epiphanes, 
or God manifest, which tells you something about the man, doesn't it? And led to long periods of both assimilation and violent resistance, resulting in these two strands of Judaism. One went along with much of Hellenization, including adopting the Greek language, as would get the Seleucids off their backs. But the traditional Aramaic-speaking Hebraic Jews suffered dreadfully in this period, and out of which the Pharisees emerged as the guardians of the Mosaic law. And as you can imagine, this led to much tension between the two groups, an example of which you find in Acts 6.1, and I'll read it to you. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Right, got all of that? Good, well, listen on. Well, it seems to me that the Hellenistic Jews coming to Jesus was a sign that the deep divisions in Judaism since the 4th century were to be healed by Jesus, the saviour of the whole nation, not just the Hebraic Jews. The ingathering had started, which was a confirmation that the culmination of his ministry was at hand. The gathering of the Jewish people from the diaspora, from the four points of the compass, was one feature of the Messiah's work, prophesied by Moses in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 5, and I'll read it to you. And when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind amongst the nation where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord God will gather you and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Of course, it also applies if there were Gentile Greek proselytes, as Jesus was to be the saviour of all peoples, wasn't he? Jew and Gentile as seen in the first servant prophecy, we call it, in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud, or lift up his voice, or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a fainting, burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice in the earth. And the coastlands, or the Gentile islands, wait for his law. Now, I think it was both which Jesus took as the now timing of his heavenly father to that sacrificial and atoning death he was born to accomplish, that it was at hand. Now, is it strange that Jesus should call his death his glorification, from the root word doxazo, from which, which means actually to magnify, to extol, to praise, and from where we get our word doxology. Well, I think not. For the meaning of the word in Greek and Jesus' embracing of it represents the complete work of his atoning death and subsequent resurrection that fully shows the wonderful character of his heavenly father, who is the one primarily glorified and who shares that glory with his son. And it's fully attested, isn't it, in verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. But that's the heart of Jesus' ministry, 
isn't it? To make his father known. To show what God is, who is spirit, what he looks like to material, physical human beings like us who otherwise would not be able to comprehend him. And so the countdown to Jesus' passion had started in earnest. But before Jesus talks of his glorif- what his glorification, his glorification entails, he calls all his disciples to follow him through death, either by laying down their lives to wholly serve the purposes of God or even to die what we would call a martyr's death. You see, whilst our salvation is secure, what we do with it matters. Only by following Jesus is the Father's affirmation guaranteed, as it was for Jesus at his baptism, recorded in Mark 1.11. You are my beloved son. I am well pleased with you. The word Jesus uses here is honour, or in Greek, time. It means loved, valued, precious. How's that for an affirmation? Wouldn't you like to have that affirmation? Now, there's a message in itself, but not for today. Jesus goes on to talk of his glorification, which entailed him being lifted up. Not as we would suppose by becoming the object of wonder and approval, but as his hearers knew, by execution, by hanging or crucifixion. You see, his his hearers knew their scripture, and it says in Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hangman is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. Strong, isn't it? Surely, they were saying, surely the Messiah, or in Greek, Christ, could not die a cursed death, could he? And what's more, we know the true Messiah will reign forever, won't he? After all, Messiah said, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth, and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will do this. That's Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. But you see, they hadn't understood that Jesus not only identified as the Messiah who would liberate his people, but also the suffering servant we've just read about, who would suffer for his people. You see, it's something the Jewish people have not yet understood, as they still see the suffering servant passages referring to the nation of Israel. Now we know the New Testament tells us that Jesus now represents and sums up the whole nation of Israel and its calling for Yahweh. Again, yet another message, not for today. But Jesus' hearers clearly did not connect either to the story of the bronze serpent You remember that? It was a symbol of sin and judgment sent by God in the form of poisonous snakes that was listed up on a pole by Moses in the wilderness, which was a symbol of the curse that came from the snake bites. As the people looked at the bronze snake, their sin and their curse was transferred to the snake. Their guilt was removed and they were healed. You see, the serpent lifted up and cursed symbolised Jesus, who became sin, so taking away sin and guilt from everyone who would look to him in faith and thus setting them free. As Jesus said in John 3, 14, 
As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Will you do this this morning? Will you do this this morning? Will you look to Jesus in faith if you haven't yet done so and have the curse of your sin and its guilt taken away that you can be set free? Well, Jesus goes on, doesn't he? He now returns to the theme that characterises the whole of John's Gospel, light. In fact, I see John's Gospel as the Gospel of light and John as the Apostle of light. That's from John 1, 4 to 5 through to 1 John 1, 5 to 7. And onwards, John repeatedly returns to the metaphor of light and its opposite, darkness. Clearly, John picked this up from Jesus as he reports in his Gospel, and which he reflects upon in his letter and on into Revelation, where he talks about the final battle between light and darkness. John reports Jesus inviting his hearers to become sons and daughters or children of light. Those who let the light of Jesus shine in all the dark places in their lives and embrace his forgiveness. And that remains the challenge for all us this morning, doesn't it? Will we embrace the light of Jesus shining into every corner of our lives and thus become fully children of light ourselves? Or will we keep some of those dark places to ourselves and shut out the light. Look, don't think for a moment that this is a painless process. It's a painful to face up to our own corrupting weaknesses and destructive selfishness, or sin, as the scriptures call it. As John said in 1 John 1, 8 to 10, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, however, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And as Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 8-9, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now I've learnt that we do not need to go rooting around to find the darkness within For that's the job of the Holy Spirit. If we invite him to, of course. Neither do we need to resort to self-flagellation. That means beating ourselves up by punishing acts of penance. When the Holy Spirit does show you the dark stuff we have been harbouring, our part is to accept his judgment on our lives ask for forgiveness and walk free. And most importantly, don't for any reason go back there. So, what will you choose this morning? To live in darkness or walk free in the light of Christ as your heavenly Father intends? We're just going to have a moment of quiet reflection on what the Lord has been saying to us this morning and then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy revealed to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you he has come 
with your light through the Holy Spirit to illuminate our lives and transform us. Lord God, we open ourselves to you this morning and say, have your way in us again. Lord God, we thank you that you are now transforming us to become like your son Jesus. Lord, we ask you to do that without let or without hindrance. As we leave this place later, we will do so in the light of Christ. Amen.
Father God, in accordance with Jesus' desire to be glorified, we magnify, extol, and praise you. We thank you that Jesus was willing to lay down his life. He knew that his death was the only way for you both to be glorified. We cannot fully appreciate the enormity of what he did, but we are eternally grateful for it. We thank you that salvation has come to us Gentiles through the Jewish nation, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem in these troubled times. We thank you that the gospel has gone out from that place to the whole world, but we pray for the completion of world evangelism according to Matthew 24, 14, so that Jesus can return. Please send more laborers out into the harvest fields. <clears throat> we thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation to worship and evangelize, and we pray for that freedom to be preserved and that we would take full advantage of it. We pray for those many nations in the world where the Christian faith is persecuted, restricted, or forbidden. We pray for the gospel to reach more people in those nations through those who are boldly proclaiming it. And we pray for the secret churches to grow and flourish despite restrictions. Please protect and guide them, Lord. Father, you tell us to pray for those in authority, so we do that now. We are sorry that we as a nation have departed from your word and your truth. We need your mercy. We pray for our government that righteous people would be in positions of authority and that they would exert influence over decisions that are made in the corridors of power. We pray for all Christian MPs and local councillors, regardless of their politics, that they would hear your voice, follow the Bible, and obey what you tell them to do and say. Please give them courage and protection. We pray for the church in our nation to come to repentance, to be revived, cleansed, and mobilized to fulfill the task of proclaiming the true gospel. We pray for our local church, for all the believers in this town of Seaford, that we would be faithful witnesses here and glorify you above all else. We ask that your glory would be seen through each individual and every church, and that this town would be more and more filled with your light and your truth, and that the darkness would be driven out in Jesus' name. Lord, you have called us into fellowship with yourself and with one another through Jesus. We are all members of your church, your body here on earth. May we have a greater understanding of what that means and truly demonstrate your power and your glory to the world by the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. May your name be glorified more and more throughout the earth in the coming days. In the wonderful, mighty, all-powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Just
thank you for joining us for our service this morning. We do pray that God has blessed you and has touched you. And before you go, however, I would like to speak over you a blessing. Or, as we heard earlier, what we call a doxology. And we find it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>